April 8th, invite to Easter. We welcome you, uh, especially if you're newer with us, we want you to know that the Oasis is a church where it's okay to not be okay. And April 8th is Easter, a great opportunity where God is knocking on the hearts of people's heart doors. And we have the opportunity to simply say, would you come to church with us? And those people can connect with Jesus Christ. And that's what we're about here, is to connect people with Jesus and each other. And uh, we just finished our Not a Fan series. been a great series over the past uh, six weeks. been very challenging for us. And uh, we have kind of a gap in our connect groups until May. So May, Dave Ramsey comes out. And I want you to know about early bird registration. Check your uh, bulletin for that. There's a significant discount. It does cost to go through the Financial Peace University. It's a lifetime membership, but it's a great opportunity to do that. So look at the registration, the early bird. It's a good discounted fee and uh, get registered for that. Then we have Easter, then our pictorial directory happening after that. So uh, a lot of things happening, a lot of opportunities to serve between now and then as well. But we begin a new series today entitled The View. Now, a person's viewpoint or what a person believes affects a lot of different things. I mean, for example, just think if, if you believe one car is better than another and you can afford that car, you're probably going to end up buying that car. And your beliefs in morals and values and ethics, that's going to decide on who you choose. It's going to be revealed in who you select as your friends or even who you vote for. And your views and beliefs in a certain coach may decide whether or not you watch pro basketball. Last week was my mom's 73rd birthday. And she, in her 60s, started watching pro basketball. Never watched it before in her life, but she loved a particular coach, and I think his name's like Rick Patino. And uh, she started watching the Boston Celtics. And then when he transitioned to college basketball again, she started watching Louisville. That's where we grew up, right across the river from Louisville, the Louisville Cardinals. The Cardinals there. Is any, are anybody college basketball fans out here, out west? I mean, we come from the Midwest. That's church out there. I mean, basketball is a, it's, it's a church. But what you believe affects how you think how you feel, and how you behave. And the same is true spiritually. What you think about God, the Bible, His truths, are going to affect everything that you do in life. That's why the first step in belief, the Bible says, is how you view God. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, anyone who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. But we've had some major slip in America, I think. In fact, I heard somebody high up say, you know what, America is not even a Christian nation anymore. And there was a recent news article that said this, Americans believe in God their own way. And it said, while Americans overwhelmingly believe in God, they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in going to church, and they kind of fashioned God, a God for themselves that they're comfortable with. In fact, research, uh, George Barnum researching his book, Unchristian, interviewed people who believed in Jesus, believed in God, but only 3% had a worldview, a viewpoint that reflected biblical values. And Barna listed eight things to have a worldview. You've got to believe that Jesus lived a sinless life, that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, that He's creator. Salvation is a gift of God. Satan is real. Christians have a responsibility to share their faith. The Bible is accurate. Unchanging moral truth exists. Such absolute truth is defined in the Bible. But Barna says Americans are picking and choosing how and what they believe. That's why I decided to teach on this subject of view, to talk about what, our, what are our essential beliefs in the Christian faith. What is it that we believe as a church? For some of you, it would probably be a review. For others, it might be laying a foundation especially if you don't come from a church background or a different church background, perhaps. So I want to begin by just having a sweeping generalization of three concepts, popular concepts of what church is today. I mean, this is just a broad scope, and one I just wanted to list as, as the Catholic Church. So I want to look at three primary church views, and one is what we have learned from the Catholic Church. It's been around forever, and the Catholic Church kind of takes as its teaching 
a blend or a mixture of the Bible and tradition as its source of authority. And I don't want to mean to be critical of any other religion today or anything like that. And, and talking about the Catholic Church since it's been around and people are familiar with that. Where we agree with the Catholic Church, we are in total alignment. Where we disagree, however, is on the point of tradition. Where the Catholic Church has elevated tradition on par, on the same level as authority as Scripture. And for example, when the, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, it means that he's speaking the words of Scripture, that what he says is on equal par with Scripture than the Vatican councils when they have voted on praying to the saints, for example. Those types of decisions, that's it, where we're going to side a little bit differently with them because they have elevated their traditions to be on the same par and equal authoritatively as the Bible. So that's kind of one concept that people have about the church today. Another concept is the liberal church. Now, the liberal church takes as its source of authority the Bible and human reason. They kind of blend those two things. I don't know any church that has liberal on their sign out front that, hey, we're a liberal church. But liberalism has infiltrated every denomination, every movement, and it's being taught and preached in many churches today. And the liberal doctrine is based more on human intellect and human reasoning than that of the Bible. <clears throat> and intellectual pride, I think, is illustrated in man has a hard time believing in things that it cannot see or things that it thinks that it cannot be, that can't be proven. That's why almost all the miracles in the Bible are kind of done away with in the liberal mindset because it's hard to get your hands around that. I mean, liberal theologians today are voting, for example, on what sayings in the Bible they believe are really authentic from Jesus or not, and they throw some out and they keep some in. I mean, as an example of that, take, for example, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 in the Bible, that Jesus took five fish or five loaves and two fish. And he did this miracle. And the liberal mind says, well, you know what I think really probably happened is Jesus had all those people there and he said, let's eat. And everybody was afraid if they shared their meal that they weren't going to have enough to eat themselves. So they could just kind of kept that. And Jesus brought this little boy up and said, here, he's got five loaves and, and two fish. Why don't we just all share our meal? And everybody went, oh, big sigh of relief. And they pulled out of their cloak this meal and they shared to the person next to him. And the liberal mind says, you know, isn't that a miracle how Jesus persuaded the people to collectively care for his neighbor. And that's, in a sense, where it was a miracle. But the problem with that is, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus performed a miracle. Now, if Jesus cannot take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people, what can he do for us today? Where does that leave us with our faith? But that's the liberal mind. So the liberal church allows human reason to be elevated even higher than Scripture. Then there's a third church, just a third view of, of a church, and that is the evangelical church. And the evangelical church looks to the Bible alone as its source of authority, and we just elevate Scripture. Years ago when I was in the beautiful Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, my mom and stepdad and myself were looking at this old homestead, and we had gotten a map, and we were walking around, and it had different points of interest. And one was the old grist mill by the creek. And we couldn't really understand the map. We are out in the woods. <coughs> there were different paths at this one point, and we had a choice to make. And my stepdad said, you know, I think that, that way kind of looks right, kind of feels right. And I said, no, Doc, I think this way looks good. And we walked about 100 yards down that path, and sure enough, there was the old grist mill, and my parents praised me for being so smart with directions. And I said, no, actually, there was a sign that had an arrow on it that I didn't point out to you. It was kind of in the undergrowth. <laughs> and the point of that is, in America today, especially in the world today, there, people have lost their way. And frankly, there's a lot of undergrowth surrounding religiosity. And people are confused about on what direction to take. And we're kind of lost. And we're so lost today, there are certain behaviors that are going on in the world today that, you know what, 
we can define those as we probably shouldn't be doing this or that. And there are behaviors that are right, that seem kind of wrong because we've lost our direction. I mean, I listened recently to a young lady who spoke before the Congress of the United States about how promiscuous she had been and about how promiscuous she plans on being. And the president, our president, the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the known world, called her up and talked with her, and he even commented about how her parents should be proud of her. Now, I know some of you might shut me out altogether, but you know what? The Bible says that there are some behaviors that are wrong and some behaviors that we really shouldn't be glorifying any way you cut it. And I want to say to the people who might object to what I'm saying, really? <laughs> but people have lost their way. And there's moral truth in Scripture. God's been very clear about certain behaviors. But the Bible says this, and we shouldn't be surprised in Proverbs 14. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And the Word of God is a compass to give us right direction, especially morally. Psalm 119 says, Your word, O God, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So at the Oasis, we are an evangelical church. We believe that God's word takes precedent over my feelings, over our feelings, over our intellect, over whatever way might seem right because we believe the Bible is God's source of authority to us. And we say with Jesus, Your word, O God, is truth. Now that word evangel, and in an evangelical church, simply means something to share. And we have something to share. We have these essential truths that we have to share as a church, that the church has agreed upon for centuries. These are not archaic beliefs. These are not radical beliefs today. They've been handed down from the apostles to Augustine, to Martin Luther, to C.S. Lewis. Today, these are common beliefs that the church has espoused over the years. I want to talk about a whole list of these, these essential church beliefs. And one is that we believe in the infallibility of Scripture, that the Scriptures are true. Now, the Bible says this about itself, and, and I'm kind of teaching today. This is really a teaching series to get our hands around some of the foundational beliefs and be reminded of that. So I want to kind of split right down the middle where that balloon is. And I want this side first to read this verse of Scripture out loud with me. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's good. That's what the Bible says about itself, that all Scripture is God-breathed. Now, I want this half to read this next verse. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Class, this side reads a little bit better than this side. Now, I'm teaching today. I just wanted to make light of that a little bit. Now, but the Scripture is God-breathed. God brought that forth. Now, what I'm saying in that, not every translation has been that accurate over the years. It's been handed down. But in its original, how God has maintained His Word and the original language, it, I believe, has been protected by God and guided and directed by God that we can know today with certainty His will for our lives today. And that's what it means. All Scripture is God-breathed. To re and to reject any portion of Scripture is kind of like rejecting the inch on a ruler. When you throw that out, it just kind of messes up the whole system. And when you throw out and pick and choose what you want and what you don't want, you know, it's going to just kind of tear up the rest of that. It's not going to be that hold that true anymore. If you will read Genesis 1-1, and if you can believe in that, you don't have any problem believing the rest of Scripture. What's Genesis 1-1 say? In the beginning, God created. God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, you can believe all of Scripture. Jesus said the Scripture cannot be broken. It is so interwoven within itself 
There's no need to start tearing some of it apart because when you do, it gets shaky. So we believe as an evangelical church in the infallibility of the scriptures. Secondly, we believe in the creation of man. Genesis 2-7 says, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now you hear a lot about the theory of evolution today. Don't you? That, but we believe that God created mankind in the beginning. Now, Frank Peretti is a Christian author, and he's kind of written this popular, about this popular belief, evolution, and he writes this. First, there was this massive goo, <coughs> and an electric bolt hit that massive goo, and it became a one-celled amoeba. It swam around the ocean for millions of years until it became tired of being an amoeba, and it developed fins and scales and became a fish. This is the theory of evolution. And then eventually, after swimming around for another million of years, it wanted to expand beyond that and crawled up on the shore and it developed a hard shell. It crawled around in water and out of the water. Eventually it liked being out of the water and it began to develop a long tail and picked up nuts and buried them in the ground. And it wanted to expand beyond that so it got a longer tail. It began to swing through the trees and eat bananas. Then eventually it stood erect and began to cuss and swear and smoke cigars and became a man. <laughs> kind of a goo to the zoo, he writes. That's a popular theory today. And, but there are noteworthy Intelligent scientists will say, you know what? It's just not provable. But there are people who believe that. Even, it takes a lot more faith, I think, to believe in that description that Frank Predig gave than to believe that in the beginning, God created. And I believe that, that God created. And the basic difference between evolution and creation is that evolution says, you know, man, was, er, man is, is getting better. He's evolving, getting better and better. But Scripture teaches us that man was created perfect, and we sin and sin, and we kind of get worse. And that leads to the next essential doctrine, the sinful nature of man. Romans seven eighteen says, I know that nothing good lives in me, yea, my sinful nature. Romans three twenty three for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. The liberal mind says, man, is, is, he's getting better. He's getting good. But Scripture says, you know, he's kind of sinful. And, and I've talked with people over the years, and I think this modern era, and you say, you know, you think you're going to go to heaven when you die. They don't go to church. They only believe in God. I believe I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Why is that? Well, I, I'm a pretty good person. If there's a heaven, I think I'm going to go over there. I've never killed anybody. And that is such a prevailing popular philosophy in our world today. But you do not have to look any further than a little child to see that we have this sinful nature. I mean, I heard something clanging in the living room the other day. So I walk around the corner, and I look up, and my 16-month-old looks me in the eye. He had been throwing his toys on the hardwood floor. I thought that was pretty cool. And I walked around, and he, he was holding this object in his hand, and our eyes met, and there was just for this moment this pause of understanding. And I thought, that's pretty cool, 16 months old. And then in a blink of an eye, this Grinch-like look came out on this child, and he threw that thing down on the ground. And I thought, even at 16 months old, I think they know there's this inner sinful struggle that we struggle with for the rest of our lives because we have this sin nature, and it just never ends. we got to kind of control that. Another important doctrine is the deity of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.9 says, In Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And that sums it up. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Jesus was not just a good moral teacher. He was just not a good leader. He was God in the flesh. And it's important that we understand this. Because the prevailing philosophies of this world is that Jesus was not God. Cults will say Jesus was a great teacher, but they object when you say Jesus was God. I had uh, my first ministry, one of my church leaders called me on the phone and he was whispering and he said, Craig, he said, do you have some scriptures you can tell me that says that Jesus is God? And I said, yeah, Jim, why? What's going on? He said, there's two Jehovah's Witnesses at the door and I don't want them to know that I'm calling the preacher. Are there some scriptures that you can have. And there are some plain scriptures. I mean, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Romans 9, 5 says, Christ who is God over us. You see, Jesus didn't begin at Bethlehem. That was His incarnation. He is Creator, God who came in the flesh. And one day it might be important that you memorize some of these scriptures too, so write some of those down. But we live in such a melting pot of religious tolerance today that doctrine is rarely mentioned. And this concept of Jesus as God in the flesh is probably more and more less mentioned. You rarely hear the Godhead or the Trinity anymore, that God is three in one. He has three personalities or three exhibitions of his character. And God, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit, and God, the Son. But the Bible says in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's this Godhead we see mentioned over and over in Scripture. Jesus was both God and man. And this teaching is at the heart of the gospel. Then there's the virgin birth of Jesus. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah said, in Isaiah 7, 14, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And he'll call him Emmanuel. 700 years later, the angel came to Mary and said, you're, gonna, you're, you're pregnant, Mary. <laughs> you're going to give birth to the Messiah. And the angel came to Joseph and said, and you know, she said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel told Joseph, what's conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. There was the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He was God in the flesh, but he came in a supernatural way as well. But the liberal mind rejects this teaching. And one translation of scriptures, the Revised Standard Version, is one that illustrates this perfectly. It's kind of the all-inclusive, gender-neutral language version. It doesn't even list that Jesus was born of a virgin. It says of Isaiah 7, 14, that a young woman was with child. And we're kind of getting away from the virgin birth a little bit. But with artificial insemination, I mean, we know that a virgin can be, have a baby. Can't. And I think God probably knew that before we found that out. But Christ is born of a virgin. And it all points back to Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created. And if you believe that, it's not hard to believe that a virgin could give birth. He's the one that made us in the first place, isn't he? And we also believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus. Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So when you look at Christ's death on the cross, it's not just that, boy, some great church leader was martyred. No, it was very purposeful death. That when he was on that cross, Jesus took the sins of the world, our sin. And his life was sacrificed for us. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. What's that mean? Let me try to explain it just a little bit. That's kind of what grace is. A young fellow heard about a guy that got a ticket uh, for reckless driving. He and a group of guys kind of doing some things they weren't supposed to do. And he didn't worry much because his dad was the judge. <laughs> so he goes and everybody's getting fined 100 bucks and convicted for reckless driving, and he knew when he got up before the judge, his dad was going to acquit him. And he stood before his dad, and he said, guilty as charged, 100 buck fine. And the kid's thinking, what? It's my dad. He said, I don't even have 100 bucks. He's going to throw me in jail, too. And uh, afterward, the dad, the judge, got off the bench, came down and said, son, I could not acquit you. That wouldn't be justice. It wouldn't be fair. But I can do this. I can pay your fine. He took off his robe, took out his wallet, gave him 100 bucks, and the kid paid his fine. Jesus Christ left his throne, and he came, and he died a sacrificial, purposeful death. He paid the fine. He paid for our sins so we would not have to. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. There are religions still today that are sacrificing animals for the atonement for sin, but Christ did it once for all. He is our supreme sacrifice. It was a substitutionary atoning death, and that's what that means. We also believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried and then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. 
Have you ever seen a resurrection? I haven't either. But the liberal mind says, since I don't see it, it never happened. And this is how they explain it away. They say, you know what? The disciples are so distraught. They love Jesus. They love this guy. They thought of his teachings and he was died. He died on the cross. They put him in the grave and they were distraught. So they went back to the upper room and they talked about that. And they said, you know what? We loved him. Let's, let's try to let him live. Let's think about what he said and let's repeat those words. Let's think about what he did and live those words. And we'll let him live in our hearts and in that way, he lives. And that's what the liberal mind says. There are professors in Bible colleges today that teach that the resurrection of Jesus Christ never happened. But the problem with that is, if Jesus couldn't come back from the grave, who cares about all of this? What hope do we have if he couldn't even raise himself? But that's our hope. First Corinthians says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. But Christ came out of that tomb bodily. And Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, touch my hands, touch my side. Thomas the skeptic touched them. He witnessed the resurrection. And he said, my Lord and my God. Because he'd seen it. That is the hinge pin, my friends, of human history, of church history, of salvational history that God in Christ was raised from the grave. That's our eternal hope. Jesus said, if I do it, you can do it too. Point eight, we believe in the literal return of Christ. <laughs> First Thessalonians says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with a trumpet call of God. And then it says, encourage each other with these words. Those are encouraging words. It's gonna, Christ is gonna come back one day it's going to be loud. It's not going to be speculation. Everybody's going to hear it. Everybody's going to see it. Nobody's going to be left behind. And Christians have called this the blessed hope for centuries. That's why that when cemeteries were designed, years ago especially, they were designed where all the graves faced east because they believed Jesus was going to come in the eastern sky. And we'd be raised up out of our graves to see Jesus face to face. And the great thing about the second coming is there's going to be this resurrection of our bodies. So what do you say about somebody who's been in the grave for a thousand years? Or maybe they were burned up or died at sea. Well, if you believe in Genesis 1-1, God's going to create new bodies. We shouldn't have a hard time understanding that if he created us out of the dust, he can do it a second time. Acts 1-11 says, the same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. One day he's going to literally return, and every, everybody in the heavens and on earth will know it, and every knee will bow, and every, some will say, Oh, Lord, my God. And others will say, Oh, Lord, my God, as they witness his return. Point nine, we believe in the resurrection and the judgment. When Jesus returns, two things are going to kind of simultaneously occur at the same time. There's going to be the resurrection of the dead, and then there's going to be the judgment. John writes this, a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And the Bible teaches in this place of eternal punishment, a place called hell. And I wish there was not a place called hell. I wish that we didn't even know about that, that when you reject Christ and you die, you just die and that's it. Liberal churches teach that today, that there's no such thing as hell. They teach universalism. Everybody's going to go to heaven one day when they die. But the New Testament, the Bible teaches there is this place over 50 times it's referenced in the New Testament, this place of eternal separation, this eternal punishment. Death in any language means separation. And hell's not going to be this place of partying. It's going to be this place where people are eternally separated from God the Father. I was questioned once, Greg, why don't you preach more on hell? And you know what? It's a, it's a good question. The preachers would do well to answer every now and then instead of slough that off a little bit. And it's not that simple to answer. But the point is, I've got about 50 Sundays a year to preach. And there's a lot to fit in. 
and to every sermon. And you know, you're trying to give a balance of the full gospel. So the people say, why don't you preach more on hell? It's like, well, do you want to preach me, hear me preach on money all the time? Do you want to hear me preach on evangelism all the time? I mean, you wouldn't want to hear me every week preach on my favorite topic. That'd get kind of boring. It's difficult to maintain a proper balance. It's like doing this series. This series isn't that inspirational for me, like not a fan was. I mean, that was challenging. I mean, where the rubber hits the road. But this stuff is important information that I need to be reminded of, that I need to be mindful of, to think of. No matter what topic I preach, however, I think God can use those scriptures. That's why one preacher said, you know, if you lose, use a lot of pre uh, scripture, that's the one thing that you're going to be saying that you know is true. And God can use that to impact our lives. But the Bible says here, there is this place of punishment. Even if I don't want to believe it, I believe it's true because the Bible says that. In fact, Revelation says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Did you know that hell was really created for Satan and his demons, his angels? It really wasn't designed in the beginning for humankind. But we have a choice. We can reject the gospel. And you know what? God respects our choice. And if we choose to reject Him, we choose our eternal destiny. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. But the good news of the gospel is we can avoid it because Christians have the hope of heaven, of eternity with God. John 14 reads this. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. So I believe, we believe as a church in a heaven and a hell. We believe that God created the world, that man, it, we do sin, we need a savior. That's why Christ came to this earth. And you know what? We should be an evangelical church and tell the world about that because we do have the good news of salvation to the world. And I wanna close with reading this verse of scripture together because this is a great hope from 1 John. Read that with me. See that what you've heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what He promised us, even eternal life. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for the church, for scriptures, for Jesus Christ, for providing truth that has prevailed through the centuries, that even if there are people around us today that discard portions of it and say, you know what, it's just kind of archaic, I pray that we would not lose our way, that we would believe it, because if we don't, what's the use? I pray for those fundamental teachings of Scripture that we could hold them in our hearts, even if we disagree, that we could just kind of look through your lens for a moment and adjust our thinking, adjust our feelings, adjust our behaviors, and see the abundant life that you have to offer, that it's good, that your will is perfect and pleasing. I pray that anyone here today who really has kind of made their own way, I pray they could heed your attention to their life today, that you would adjust and correct their path, that we could yield and submit for a little bit to consider your ways, that your word might be a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path, that we might see the hope that you offer even in a darkened world that we live in. And I pray, Father, today would be the salvation of us here today, that we can understand the importance of telling people this good news. Not because we just want them to be puppets or to believe like us, but because we believe that it's our eternal hope that we have that to share with everybody. May we be encouraged by that today as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.